How's my friends doing? I'd like to start this off tonight by sending out my prayers all the way across the world over to Italy. Uh, I was not aware that there were that many fatalities, but the last two earthquakes have taken lives. Uh, it's a sad deal. It, Italy is a place that has history behind it. A lot of world history. Really old. There was a building I think you may have heard, if not. I believe they said it was built in 1293. That's amazing to me. 1293, what is that, 719 years ago? Well, it lasted a long time. They pulled a survivor out. I haven't heard that they pulled any more out. But I know they did find one buried under some rubble. And they've had aftershocks. Uh, right now I haven't seen anything at the moment. Currently it was like I had been seeing with the exception of the Argentinian earthquake the other day, the 6.7. Mainly you see a lot of the lower magnitudes and when you think of 5.8 you, you're not really going off your rocker for 5.8 but uh, structurally and the location and whatnot of the way that was situated you know it was able to do the damage that it did and you know there's a lot of different things so you know architecturally in different parts of the world the way they build things uh, I'm not sure if I describe it in the right way. They kind of make like uh, some places like terraces, you know, stair stepped up on uh, hills, so to speak. Beautiful to look at and great to live in, you know, so to speak, as long as nothing's going on and then something bad happens and it's not such a great world anymore, a place to be. You can see there's a 4-4, and this would be the 29th, and this is, you know, all the stuff here. So, afterwards they did get upwards 5-4 and 5-1 also. We go backwards in time, and, you know, we see a place like, say, Tonga, for instance. Well, they got the same thing, but the results were different because of the situation of where they're located and the different kind of uh, landmass and architecture and the uh, age of structures and whatnot, what kind of structures were they, etc. There's your Argentinian one a few days ago. It just goes to remind us that doesn't always have to be a 7.0, a 6.5, or whatever. It, it, it goes hand in hand with where you're at and how things are made where you're at. What's the land like where you're at? It all plays in. The so next. I had spoke about Fukushima radiation for a little while. I had said all along we were all getting dosed. Now I had said it's invisible. Everybody knows that. I used to show the model, the initial modeling from after March 11th. Someone had even written me and said, well this is not current. You're showing something old, you know, what are you doing, trying to scare people or what? And I even had to write him, and I think I said in the video that later talks about that that showed that model, that was for illustrative purposes only, while I was speaking, explaining. 
this article goes to show you. You already knew about the junk floating over from Japan. It's going to be the size of the whole state of California if you piled it up. Everything that was taken out finds its way across the ocean. Even fish. And these are tuna. I'm surely maybe people have heard this. It's nice to be able to transfer information if you haven't. But 6,000 miles across the Pacific to the California shore, these fish tracked. And it's the first time they've been able to carry the radioactivity such a long ways, and they're well, they're startled. And the modeling used to show the cesium when I showed the model. And the level of radioactive cesium was 10 times higher than the amount measured in the tuna off the California coast in the previous years, but even so, that's still far below safe to eat limits set by the U.S. and Japanese government. Well, isn't that nice to know? You're eating more of it, but it's still safe for you. Previously, the littler fish were found with higher levels in the Japanese waters, but the scientists didn't expect the fallout to linger in the bigger fish. That could sail the world. And why are they telling you this? Because such of those fish, the larger ones, can metabolize and shed radioactive substances. The bluefin tuna can grow to 10 feet and weigh more than 1,000 pounds. And they spawn off the Japanese coast and swim east. And five months after the disaster, well, they decided to test them. They were caught off the coast of San Diego. Tissue samples from all 15 contain levels of cesium and cesium, 34, 134, and 137, that were higher than before. The results are unequivocal. Fukushima was the source. And they absorb radioactive cesium from swimming in contaminated waters and feeding on contaminated prey such as the krill and the squid. And they shed some of the radiation as they were swimming away from there over here and as they grow. It's amazing to them that they could swim that far and retain all these radion oxides. Now that they know that they can transport it, they want to track the movements of the other migratory species, including sea turtle, sharks, and seabirds. Well, if it's in the fish, like I've, like I've said a million times, it went in the water. We know they dumped radioactivity into the water. You know, the water they were shooting on it, it had to go somewhere. And then there was reports that they were actually dumping into the water, which I can believe that. <clears throat> I heard all kinds of things told to me from my friend that lives in Japan. Well, it was airborne too. And they, the model would show, remember, that it dissipated in certain areas and then some just came over and had a huge cloud that just circulated got mostly worldwide everywhere well it gets into animals in the water and it's definitely got into some animals on land then and then we eat them uh, you know what would this is just a tidbit what would they tell the, the world you know you can or, Areas that eat tuna and fish tuna and sell tuna and not everybody eats it, but what would they tell, you know, everyone, uh, sorry, uh, can't eat any more fish, uh, Fukushima, remember? You dump all that radiation, so everybody can't eat any fish. And that's not going to work. So you have to be careful and use your, 
you know, use your judgment. I like shrimp myself, but even after the BP, as long as it's been, I don't eat them very rarely anymore because I can't tell where they came from, really. And uh, next time you pick up some cans of chicken of the sea, maybe you'll be wondering, could it be some of these fish? Where did they come from? They're just going to put it out there. Unless you see a whole mass of people all of a sudden sickening, and then they'll do what they do, launch a little investigation, supposedly, come up with an answer and a solution, or if that, and then they'll continue to, we have to eat. So, you know, some avenues are actually closed because we depend, we become dependent. It's not like our grandparents or great grandparents backwards in time. Backwards in time you did a lot for yourself. You raised your own food mostly. You know, some some things you went and bought in town, but a lot of it, just like my mom's mom and dad, my grandparents, a lot of it they did their self. And they were not dependent totally on other sources of getting food and eating. Nowadays, I don't know the true percentage, but it would be really high, I'm sure. Let's say, you know, 98% or something of people do not do that anymore for themselves. And I'm not counting the little garden out in the, in the backyard. That's just, you know, a hobby. I'm counting living daily for the whole year in and out. And we go to stores. So the manufacturers of the food, the suppliers, producers, we're kind of at the mercy of them, unfortunately. And we all have to eat. So be aware and think what you may, but. I still say we got dosed and we're getting dosed and we just have to be aware of it and try to make healthy choices and use our our good judgment and our intelligence. Now what we have here, you've probably heard about that, maybe you haven't, the Chagas disease and the quotation may be the new HIV AIDS of the Americas. This one was printed uh, not long ago, 6.40 p.m. And it is a tropical illness transmitted by insects that bite. And it could be a threat to poor populations, supposedly, in the Americas and Europe. And the so-called experts co-authored the editorial. And the endemic Chagas disease has emerged as an important health disparity in the Americas. We face a situation in both Latin America and the U.S. that bears a resemblance to the early years of the AIDS HIV pandemic. And just like that, this disease was already prevalent in Central and South America. A long incubation time it is hard or impossible to cure. We need to pay attention to this. A number of striking similarities between people living with this disease and people who had the AIDS, contracted the AIDS, and HIV in the first two decades of the epidemic. Hmm, very similar things are seen. How this moves and, and goes, huh? Unlike HIV, which is sexually transmitted, this is not. It's caused by a parasite spread through the bites from reduvid insects, commonly known as kissing bugs. 
And while HIV AIDS attacks your immune system, this one attacks your heart and digestive organs. And the National Institute of Health says complications from this disease can include inflammation of your heart, your esophagus, your colon, and make you have an irregular heartbeat or heart failure. And some believe, for some reason, that this may have killed Charles Darwin. I never heard that, that's news to me, but some believe. Although, they also say that it can take more than 20 years from the original time of your infection to develop these problems. The onset of the symptoms can be catastrophic. According to the New York Times, one quarter of people that contract this disease eventually develop enlarged organs that can potentially burst and cause you sudden death. Well, it can also spread from mother to child and through blood transfusions. It is curable, which is kind of contradictory to what I thought we just read earlier, if it's caught early. Well, I guess if it's not caught early, then they, they didn't contradict the treat, but the treatment is expensive and stigmatizing, and it already is affecting 10 million people in Central and South America, and a concern that could come up here, over here to the U.S. And the globalization of it translates up to one million cases here alone, if it gets here. With especially high burden in Texas and along the Gulf Coast. And there are other estimations here at the bottom that says that they suggest there may be approximately 300,000 cases in the U.S. I didn't know there were so many. Now they're trying to say here climate change may be a prime factor in the spread and other tropical illnesses. And then the so-called expert on this disease and co-author on the paper uh, said warmer climates would absolutely push the carriers of the disease further north. Well, that could be possible, maybe. And we know the bugs are already across the bottom two-thirds of the U.S. Uh-oh. So the bugs are here. Parasites are here. Very likely with climate change it will shift further to the north. And the range of some species will extend. Well, I hadn't paid enough attention to this. But this has piqued my definite interest in the finding out a little bit more about how this thing works. A little more in depth than what this article said. So if we've got some things going, let's hope this doesn't go anywhere. And let's hope if it is going somewhere further, more people getting it, that they develop a treatment more than what they supposedly have now and it will be made available to us well, we've got a lot of stuff coming we got a lot of stuff happening now war or possible upcoming war in Syria you know you hear stuff that we're gonna arm the rebels or the fighters against Assad's forces and it reminds me of a month or two or three years ago when McCain was talking and I can remember the suggestion was that we would arm the rebels, which would essentially kind of like make us a proxy war. They fight for us, we just give you the weapons. And I remember he said there was always a way, it may have been a slip up, but he said it was always a way to get weapons to, to a faction. 
Now that kind of maybe it went over some people's heads or they didn't notice, but I caught I caught a little something out of that. So he's not going anywhere, just like I said. You hear all this junk about uh, we're pulling diplomats out and yeah, Russia's getting hacked off and they're pulling their support. And blah blah blah. It doesn't matter what they're saying. I do not believe the man is going to go. I don't care what the Russians do. What are they going to do? You know, begging? Uh, are they going to bribe him? Like, hey, we'll give you a trillion dollars if you leave. It's... He's the ruler. It's his country. I mean, he's got force behind him. It's in his blood. It's in his family heritage. It's in the heritage of his country. Uh, long term from beginning to eventual end. It's, I don't see it. You got things going on behind the scenes. You know, you got your cyber uh, infections going, uh, trying to slow the Iranians down on their completion of, of uh, their nuclear research and armament and missile. You got so many things going that are kept so quiet they're already mostly d done or in the process of being done by the time you catch wind of them and sometimes you don't catch wind of them so we're gonna go if the UN or NATO or whoever we're taking our real orders from If they give the go ahead, we'll go. It's there. You got a lot of people, not really publicized about it, that are pushing for military intervention in there. In this this last couple of days, with the killing that went on, well, that's what they're doing. They're they're pushing harder because uh, they're making you know. A deal that the U.S. is a, is a protector. We need to get involved. So it it's just going to be another deal where they're trying to get rid of a guy that won't play ball with him. You know, nothing, nothing. These uprisings have produced nothing. When you look at the totalitarian everything, Egypt has produced nothing. And what I see in Tunisia has produced nothing. What I see in Yemen, it's produced nothing. Iran has produced nothing. Afghanistan has produced nothing. And you go to Syria, it's not going to produce nothing. Nothing's gotten any better for those people. I mean, what are, what are they doing? Just like I said, Muslim Brotherhood is, is a big shot in the election. Uh, and even they're crying, supposedly foul, that the military is, is still running the show and they don't like that. It's a big giant power uh, vacuum struggle. It, it's just a play out though. <clears throat> the people haven't gotten any better. Nothing's gotten better for those people since this has all happened. It's, you know, so what's the excuse? It's going to take 50 years? You, know, you don't do things like this overnight? Is that what they're going to you know try to play? It's just a stepping stone to putting people in charge that, that will do what the eventual people at the top tell them. Run this this way. Do this. We're going to do this. Now some of these guys just wouldn't do it. It's just the bottom line. I mean, say what you will about Saddam Hussein, but I'll always think that partial reason that we went there is because he was going to uh, stop accepting the dollar and trade for the oil. Uh, I, did, I heard that a lot and I did a lot of reading about that. And uh, a lot of people didn't like that, so... You know, we didn't find anything over there. And it, it's not faulty intelligence. This goes, you know, this goes back a decade or, or a little longer, for sure. But 
there's not many Arab states left over there that, that they want to topple that I can see right now. It looks, looks to me like Jordan's going to play ball. I don't think they're going to go for Saudi Arabia, at least not right now. But they do, like I was alluding to, they do want to use military in Syria. Uh, it could be just big talk trying to threaten him. And then you get to the other side of the coin where he's saying that, hey, you know, these are mercenaries that are hired from blah, 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 and they're coming at me. You know, we're just defending. You know, this is all the bad U.S. and whatever. So you get that flip side of the story, too. And they're sitting over here. And you know, we don't see for sure because we're here. We're not experiencing it. Uh, we rely on, you know, on the ground. Sometimes people over there can catch stuff and put it out. But we even have to wonder the truth of that, too, because it's a, it's a strange world, you know, with the Internet and instantaneous uh, ability to show things. It's could be either way. You just have to, you know, be there yourself and we can't so we have to again trust our judgment and not buy into some of the things that we're told by the media well, we did that you know 11 years ago and it's been going on 11 years straight ever since 911 and you know that's when it became definitely noticeable and, and much talked about. So June is going to be a big month because I thought that Israel was going to going to try some stuff in June sometime. But like I was saying before, they they may be trying the the, the non-explosive method, which would be trying to viralize them their computers and stuff and wipe things out that way. Now if, they're, if it works, it works. Uh, you know, Stuxnet or whatever they're, whatever they're gonna call it this time, whatever. But if it doesn't work, and, and they you know, still wanna stop something, then they'll launch in the old special forces of theirs or something. The price of gas is stabilized. Thank God it didn't get to four and a quarter here in April like they predicted. You do hear a lot of stuff about the world economy. And uh, Greece, of course, is trashed in the sense that they're broke. Italy is in poor financial situation. And uh, Spain, I believe. They're pretty well, all three are toasted, you know, they have to be bailed out big time. Well, there's a lot of worry going over there in Europe and uh, my friend you know more about it than I do those of you that live in Europe and uh, percentage wise I hear that the Euro mostly populace wants to keep it but it seems that there is quite a several people that don't want to keep it so it is not uh, quite evenly split but it is not a dominating majority that want to keep it. So for different reasons, they feel different ways. I did hear some people over there saying, you know, that they don't like it at all. But the only reasons that they would be for keeping it is just like here, you know. They're worried that if there's a change over what they got now, will be worthless. And they realized from the last changeover also that you know things went way up. Once they changed this over it went way up. Does anybody uh, remember years back? Uh, remember seeing on on the telly that the stores and the shelves, the grocery markets and stuff like that were like really bare. You know, they were having really hard times and stuff in financial and changing over for the euro and, and junk like that. <clears throat> and the price went way up and people went, had to adjust. 
you know, everything had to adjust. And, and you've still got a lot of poor people over there. It's like over here and everywhere else. You know, it just, they don't appear on the cameras half the time. You know, because that's not what they show in the news. I mean, how much, you know, they actually show of each country of the poor people. I mean, you don't see a god awful lot of stuff about poor people in the world. You know, a CNN special report, you know, now and then or something. We'll pray for all the poor, all the sick, all the dying, all the scared, all the hungry, all the worried, all the lonely. Every situation, every person has their needs. And they need all of us to realize that and concentrate our efforts not only on ourselves but when we are praying about things but somebody else because they need that. If, if they don't have anybody and they're forgotten it's to them, you know, it's like they don't exist, kind of. The Sudan, I believe I read about them. I believe it was Sudan. And the poor are so hungry, and there's nothing there. there there's a little block area where, for some odd reason, the, the agreement called that nothing goes in there. So they have to walk. I believe it's five days to the sh where there is the food at the camp. Well, in the meantime, I believe it said they picked leaves off of a certain type of a tree, and I think they said they soaked them for several days, and then they became edible after their soaking. And it got even worse than that. And if I read that right, they ran out of leaves. I guess they ate them off all the trees. Well, then the seeds that they would have used to plant more of the trees, they ate the seeds. They were so hungry they ate the seeds. And I believe it even went farther and said, now they don't have enough leaves to eat or seeds to eat. And then you, you even hear about uh, poor, you know, in different parts of the world that eat dirt. You know, actual, actual dirt. Because that's all they've got, you know. And then, they, speaking of the, uh, in the Sudan, how much could that fill you up eating some leaves or some seeds? And then you have to walk five days to where there is some actual food. Well, this is being allowed. You know, you don't hear about that mainstream on television. And that wasn't a big article in the newspaper. So, people are starving to death. We're on the other side of the world. And it's like one side eats and part of the other side don't. And that's just the way they run it. That's the way they allow it. And this has got rather long-winded, hasn't it? But I've been getting some things out. There's so much to get out. I can't put it all in 34 minutes or even an hour in 34 minutes. But i got a lot left. So I'm going to let everybody go, and I'll be talking about some more world events here. Maybe not, but there is much more to discuss and bring out and, and to be reminded of and realize and dissect. So we're almost at the end of the week, but not quite. It's not long. I hope nobody's got to work seven days a week if you don't want to. I hope you get at least a day off. I hope everyone has good health, worry-free mostly, optimistic even though things can be hard, 
things can be coming that's going to be hard. Long term, in the end, long run, things work out. We'll talk to you soon. And don't forget, June the 5th, transit of Venus. Once in a lifetime. Not going to happen again. Not for me or, you know, probably you or any of your children. And that's history. When something takes that long to happen again, you need to pay attention to it now while it is happening. Because there has to be a reason. And the reason is probably we're the generation that gets to see it. And it's a big time deal in the time spectrum of what do things mean. So y'all be good. Y'all be safe. You'll hear from me soon. Good night. Goodbye.